Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, you get me, Dr. Janine Krause, talking about why we wake up between 2 to 4 a.m. and what you can do about it. We're going to be talking about how your liver and lung mess with your wake up. So we're going to talk about blood sugar, metabolism, cortisol, potassium, magnesium, and last but not least, your progesterone and estrogen levels and how they mess with your sleep. So let's dive in and get started. So one of the most fascinating things to me about sleep is that we get so much done while we're sleeping. We're working on all kinds of things like repair. We're working on detox. How cool is that? So sometimes those things wake us up, whether we know it or not. And in Chinese medicine, there's a clock, like a body clock, of what's happening at given times during the day. And coincidentally enough, between the 2 to 4 a.m. time frame, we have two organs that are really important for detox and metabolism and pH balance in the body. So between 1 and 3 a.m., this is when our liver is really active. It's liver chi time, as we are told in our Chinese medicine training. And between 3 and 5 a.m., this is the time of the lungs. And your lungs, you might be thinking like, okay, I get the liver. I know that's metabolism. Maybe I've had a couple glasses of wine one night and woke up between somewhere between 1 and 3 and been like, oh, I feel crappy. Well, oh, that was your liver at work. But the lungs, like how do the lungs tie in here? Well, the lungs are very interesting because you use your lungs to balance your pH of your blood crazy, right? So depending on breathing fast or breathing slow, you have different levels of carbon dioxide within your blood. And you would think that you don't want much in terms of carbon dioxide in the blood. But in reality, the more you have, the more basic your blood is. Now, don't misunderstand me that yes, we keep a very tight balance between our blood levels. So your blood pH really is 7.35 to 7.45. I've just fact-checked myself for you just to make sure that my brain had not forgotten what's going on there. Now, breathing is in charge, right, of, of how you keep that tight 7.35 to 7.45 pH of your blood. But interestingly enough, your carbon dioxide levels that build up in your blood, we can look at those with the comprehensive metabolic panel. And I can tell if someone is breathing well or over-breathing. What the heck does that mean? You'll have a low carbon dioxide level in your blood if you overbreathe, meaning you're hyperventilating. So your blood's going to tend towards being on the more acidic side of that 7.35 to 7.45 range. Now, if you breathe longer and hold longer exhales, you'll have a tendency to have more carbon dioxide in your blood, which will keep you more basic, which is less inflammatory. This is a good thing. So where am I going with this? Really, between 3 and 5 a.m., if we're breathing funny while sleeping, meaning hyperventilating, we may have some pH changes that wake us up. So folks with sleep apnea, folks who snore, there could be some very interesting things going on with the pH of your blood overnight, and that triggers to your brain that, oh, something's off. So a lot of times in my practice, if I'm seeing a 2 to 4 a.m. wake up and we've tried all the other things and nothing's working, sometimes I'll go, hey, maybe a home sleep study may be worth it. In this day and age, you can do home sleep studies very easily. If docs use a company called SNAP, S-N-A-P, Diagnostics, you can get everything delivered to your home. Super easy peasy. Something to think about. Now, let's move on from the liver and lung because those two are there. There's something to think about. Let's talk about blood sugar and magnesium for a second. Now, a lot of folks are aware that blood sugar can have impact throughout the day for energy levels, but I think we're not quite explaining how blood sugar imbalances during the day can lead to issues overnight. One of the most common things and one of the like hallmark signs of imbalanced blood sugar is someone needing to eat before bed to make sure that they can sleep through the night or waking up in the middle of the night needing to go eat. 
this is a real deal thing. A lot of people are embarrassed to talk about it. And so if this is happening to you, this is, listen up. So what's happening is blood sugar is on a roller coaster up and down throughout the day. There may be some stress involved in, in inducing this because I've also seen this happen in folks who do not eat enough protein, but don't eat a lot of carbs either. I also see this in folks that do not eat consistently. That's a thing. And so I've also, I have to mention this, this is something because a lot of people are doing fasting. I've also seen this in folks who fast who have a lot of stress because you cannot eat any food. You could be stressed, your cortisol goes up and get, guess what? Blood sugar goes with it. So let me paint the picture. If you start your day off without a lot of protein, right? You, you grab a banana, you're on the go, you get a, you know, or maybe you get a scone and a coffee at Starbucks, whatever it may be. And you get started through your day, you get some stress when you get to work. And then maybe by two o'clock, you're like, oh man, I didn't eat all day. Then you decide to grab an, a salad with some chicken, which totally healthy, but now we have no carb in there and you've already tanked the carb. And so now the body's like trying to figure out how it's going to get you to have a snack at like three o'clock when the, you know, candy bowl over at the office, since it seems to be a thing, someone's always got the candy bowl, that becomes really attractive to you. So then you go over and you get the candy. Now you spike the blood sugar and then it's slowly on a decline. Then you get home and you're like, man, I do not feel like making dinner. I'm going to, I'm going to do popcorn and wine for dinner. That's what's happening. Well, blood sugar back up and then it's got to come back down at some point. When does it come back down in the middle of the night? And that's when you get triggered to go eat food. Now, I might have gave a little bit of an extreme example, but that's something that can happen. And the other thing that's really common and probably not talked about as much either is magnesium deficiencies in sleeping through the night. Well, let's say in, in sleeping through the night connected to blood sugar. A lot of people are aware that if they have magnesium, they're going to sleep better, but they're not necessarily con connected to the blood sugar component of it. Magnesium is used by the body to bring carbohydrates into the cells for metabolism to make energy. If you don't have enough magnesium in the body, you will struggle with insulin resistance, higher blood sugar, things of that nature. So a lot of folks are thinking about magnesium for relaxing muscles, helping sleep through the night, but they're not really connecting it that if you had more protein consistently throughout the day, say every three to five hours between like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you might do better with sleep and not need as much magnesium to help you to sleep. Like you could take it on a lower level, but you might not need it as much. Something to think about. Just something to think about. Now I'm asked all the time, what's the best magnesium for sleep? What's the dosage? Dosages vary. Magnesium citrate will help you poop and sleep, but uh, you got to be careful there in terms of dosage. Some people will have a good bowel movement the next morning on 320, 350 milligrams, whereas some folks are good at like 120, 150. Magnesium glycinate, other good magnesium. I like to call it magnesium G for good. It's not going to have you magnesium C for going to the bathroom. Crap. Um, I try to think of those ones in terms of those memory tools. Now, for some people, magnesium glycinate can also push the bowels too. So if you are sensitive in your gut to magnesium, magnesium malate and magnesium three and eight are the ones you're wanting to think about for magnesium deficiencies. Those dosages are higher. They're about 500 to 1,000 milligrams for magnesium malate and magnesium three and eight. Now, magnesium three and eight has a great side of benefit. It has been found to be good for the brain too. So I've kind of been gravitating towards that one a little bit late <laughs> as of late with my mind. So something to think about there. That's magnesium. Magnesium can also be quite helpful for cramps at night. So those leg cramps that can wake you up or Charlie horses in terms of how I was explain them as a kid. Now B12, folate, vitamin B6, potassium, those can also be tied in there as well, which is why it's key to kind of test these things to know what's going on. You can easily test B12 and folate. You can test iron levels. You can test your potassium and electrolytes in your blood just to know, are you on a low spectrum of things, high spectrum of things? Because sometimes if it shows normal within the parameters, you could still be having cramps because of a low normal level of vitamins and minerals. So something to think about we have genetic mutations that can be messing with things um, overnight 
in terms of the cells, so something called methylation. It's very popular now. Everyone's kind of awake to it. And ha half the population, 50% of the population uh, worldwide has a methylation defect, which is, you know, what is a methylation? Methylation is detox, and in particular, of uh, on, on a cellular level. And it takes B12, folate, iron, and those types of things, magnesium, other minerals, other vitamins, and amino acids to help to run these cycles. And so it is wise to look into methylation to help you with cellular detox, but also preventing cramps and other things and, and, and optimizing sleep. So not too many people is talking about that. They're talking about methylation in terms of moods, depression, anxiety, and also talking about in terms of cholesterol. So another connection there. Now, I mentioned potassium. And I mentioned cramps. A lot of folks think like, ah, if I have a banana before bed, I'm going to be good. And, and maybe you may, you may be. But what I've found over time is using cream of tartar, which is potassium bitartrate. Quarter teaspoon in water after dinner or at least two hours before bed. And I'm finding less cramps in folks. But I'm also finding that can help with sleep. So if you're waking up a lot at night to go to the bathroom and you're like, man, I cut off my liquids at like two, three hours before bedtime, what gives? This could be one of the things. So just a little planting a little seed that you could use cream of tartar. You could also get a potassium bitartrate or potassium citrate, any of those types of supplements too, and try them out as well. Now, potassium is tricky. It comes with the warning. Too much potassium, it can mess with heart rate. Your heart rate can speed up. You can get palpitations. Nobody wants that. So this is why it's it's wise to get your electrolytes tested in your blood and work with someone to know what dosage to take. However, anywhere between an eighth to a quarter teaspoon of, of cream of tartar is something that I've found to be generally safe for most folks. Keep in mind, this is not a substitute for medical advice here on the Health Fix podcast. It's more just what I've seen work and, and help out folks. So trying out this trick of a quarter, and, and if you're sensitive, go down to an eighth, or if you're working on kids, definitely a sixteenth to an eighth with a fairy dust there um, works out. But keeping in mind that everyone is different, and this could be helpful, but about for a week, if it doesn't work within a week, then okay, it's not your thing. You know, sometimes even a couple nights, three nights, you'll, you're going to know potassium effects show up quickly if it's going to work for you. So that being said, if your cream of tartar that you normally use for biscuits is hanging around and you got some late cramps or you're waking up at night to pee, try it out and see what, see what happens. Hey, health junkies, having been a former insomniac, I know how important sleep is for your health and daily performance. And when you can't sleep, the anxiety and frustration that shows up around bedtime can be intense. This is why I've partnered with Devin Burke and his Sleep Science Academy to help you end insomnia and sleep issues once and for all. How good would it feel to eliminate sleep anxiety? Stop waking up between 2 and 4 a.m. like clockwork. Feel rested when you wake up and not have to take handfuls of supplements or medications to do that. Devon's Sleep Science Academy is not another dial-in-your-sleep hygiene program. It provides you with the support you need paired with cutting-edge sleep technology to help you understand your sleep at a deep, holistic level. Let's face it, most people spend $500 to $3,000 a year on supplements or meds for sleep. Not to mention all the lost productivity and being able to enjoy life to the fullest. Priceless. So, with their no-risk money-back guarantee, what do you have to lose but another night of sleep? Head to doctor, spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E-N-D dot com forward slash E-P-474 to check out Devin's Sleep Science Academy. Now, the next big one that I think a lot of folks are aware of, but not necessarily sure how it kind of plays into to hormone balance, is cortisol and DHEA. These are, you know, we know cortisol is a stress hormone. DHEA is the precursor to cortisol. They both can mess with sleep. And if you're stressed out, your DHEA levels are going to go up. Same thing with cortisol. Now, 
because DHEA has a branch off where it goes to making testosterone, you may start to make a little more testosterone and maybe you'll make a little more estrogen, which can help counter that elevation of, of cortisol and, and keep you sleeping. But sometimes our cortisol levels will outpower, outpower or outweigh, let's say, our melatonin levels because melatonin is what is needed to keep us asleep and cortisol is what wakes us up. And in some cases, melatonin will actually be suppressed by elevated levels of cortisol. This happens very commonly in perimenopause and menopause as progesterone levels decline and as estradiol levels decline. And in particular, estradiol. We need the estrogen estradiol to help us make serotonin and then help us to make dopamine and to help us make melatonin. This is interesting here because so many folks are waking up over and over again. And, we, and we've got the tout of like, oh, use progesterone to help you sleep. Oh, try bioidenticals to help you sleep, which can be beneficial. But knowing which one to use, game changer. If you've been stressed for a very long time, it is common for your body to steal the precursors to make progesterone and make cortisol instead. There are some folks that debate that uh, about how much that actually happens. But the reality is, if you look at labs of, of women who are stressed, you're going to see less progesterone. That is common. It's common in general to see less progesterone, especially as you head through perimenopause and beyond. Now, in menopause, I will see more levels of low progesterone and low levels of estradiol, the most useful estrogen. The connection between these two is stress will pull on the amounts of progesterone and we will not have enough progesterone to calm our nervous system. Progesterone is a nervous system sedative. It's our chill sister. Progesterone can even help men. I've used it in some of the firefighters that I see that struggle with chronic insomnia. We microdose tiny little amounts and guys will sleep better. Now in women, if it's progesterone and estradiol that we're having issues with, then we work on a little bit of estradiol in addition to the progesterone to help with sleep. If the sleep issues happen the week before the period or the week after ovulation, these are times when estrogens drop off. We target those for having a little bit more estradiol in the system. Like I said before, estradiol helps us to make melatonin via serotonin. Crazy, right? So there are a lot of supplements that have 5-HTP, which is a precursor to making serotonin. It comes, it's like an intermediate agent that comes between the tryptophan and then making the, the serotonin. Tryptophan is an amino acid that our body uses to make serotonin. It's from protein. That's why we're heavy on protein, protein, protein. As you get older, this is one of the reasons. Tryptophan converts to 5-HTP, converts to serotonin, and then we need enough serotonin to help to make melatonin, but we need estradiol to do it. So this is one of those big connections that, and I don't know how many people are necessarily talking about this in great detail, but that is why having bioidentical hormones or something that helps support your estradiol production, like black cohosh, red clover, things of that nature, can help you along the way. So once we look at hormones, it's very interesting to be able to see the balance here because I've mentioned before that in Dutch tests, so this is dried urine testing that I use combined with saliva to help me to understand what's happening with hormone metabolism. A lot of times in those tests, I don't see a melatonin deficiency. I often will see more progesterone deficiencies and deficiencies in estradiol. Now, you would think, well, if there's not a melatonin deficiency, why would estradiol help with sleep? Well, because it helps with the natural production of serotonin. It moves that through. I think it's just, let's put it this way, synergistic. Because if we take out the pathways, right, and we just funnel in melatonin, yeah, it's going to help us sleep, but we're going to be groggy the next day. And so thinking about further up the pathway, 
would it be more beneficial to consider adding in a little estradiol and helping with serotonin? So could some tryptophan supplementation be helpful? Maybe could 5-HTP supplementation be helpful? Yeah. But what about more protein? You got to eat. I'd much rather have people eating than taking pills to try to counter things. Let's be real. So when it comes to sleep, there are lots of things that wake us up between 2 to 4 a.m. So let's recap what we talked about. We talked about the liver metabolism. We talked about the lung and breathing. If there's any issues there, I often will have people consider, you know, getting a, a little bit of a chem panel, see if there's any liver enzyme elevations. Maybe we do a little liver detox. Maybe we'll look at homocysteine levels. Homocysteine is something that can tell us what's going on in the liver too. And it can tell us if someone is having issues with methylation. The lung. This is where sleep tests come in, but also in a metabolic panel, I can look at carbon dioxide and go, hmm, is it too high? Is it too low? Do we need to work on breathing throughout the day or some breath work at night? Or do we need to get a sleep study to see what is going on in the middle of the night? All valuable information. Now, potassium, magnesium, those guys, we can test them in the blood too. You can do fancy testing or you could do red blood cell magnesium and you can do potassium as electrolytes to know what's going on. We can always look at our blood sugar, but we can also, let's say intuitively understand if our blood sugar is off, right? What do you eat throughout the day? If it's a lot of carbs, chances are your blood sugar is doing a roller coaster. If there's more protein and it's sequenced out between three to five hours throughout the day, probably doing better. So those things are definitely things you want to evaluate. And if you're craving, sure. Or if you're waking up in the middle of the night to eat, that is definitely blood sugar imbalance. But there's also a possibility of some cortisol stuff. Most of us know how stressed we are and what happens in terms of how we, we behave when we're stressed, right? We want more carbs. We want snack food. We don't want to take care of ourselves. We want to just keep go, 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 do, do, do. And, and sometimes we sacrifice sleep. And that can also create patterns of, of trouble with sleeping. And then there's the hormones. And I have even found women younger and younger in their 30s, mid 30s to need progesterone to help with sleeping through the night. As we get older into our 40s and 50s, that's more when the estradiol becomes useful. But if you look at mood, there may be some really interesting connections with serotonin, dopamine. I didn't even talk about dopamine. Dopamine's precursor is tyrosine. Also comes from amino acids. It is tyrosine's an amino acid, so from the protein you eat. Back to protein, protein. <laughs> Most of us in the anti-aging, I don't, I don't want to call myself anti-aging, and the slowing aging and op health optimization space are talking about protein. You've, you've heard it on repeat. But this is why. This is why we're talking about it, because it has all kinds of effects for your hormones, and it has all kinds of effects for you feeling good in your body and helping you to sleep. Serotonin, of course, is our neurochemical that's tied much more to sleep, and, and it's tied into estradiol levels. So if you're noticing at certain times of your cycle you're having trouble, sleep, you're wanting to look and see where might estradiol be dipping and where might progesterone be dipping. And there are patterns, very heavily patterns. And, and for some people before the period, it could be the need for progesterone. It could be the need for estradiol. Usually it's estradiol as we get older, progesterone as we're younger. So this is why we test and not guess to have, to have the ideas here. And then with DNA testing, now it's starting to get more advanced and I'm feeling like it's, it's useful, right? The, the, the testing is more concrete, more accurate, and the, the machines they use for sequencing can help a lot better now to get your, your good SNPs. And I'm finding for a lot of people, knowing your methylation status, knowing other detox pathways, so transsulfuration pathways. There's a test with Genova Diagnostics that looks at this stuff. It's a methylation panel. It can be really helpful for you to just understand what's going on with your detox pathways and are they impacting your sleep? Because if you wake up at 2 to 4 a.m. and you can get right back to sleep, no big deal. That happens. A third of the population in, in Europe does that apparently according to one study that I read recently. But really the bottom line is if you're waking up at 2 to 4 a.m. and you can't get back to sleep, this is a problem. 
and there are things you can do about it. You just got to do a little sleuthing. So I will have all the things I just talked about in my notes at drjkrausnd.com so you can check it all out. And I also am following up or ahead of these podcasts I am putting into my newsletter. It's not a newsletter. It's just my emails. I'm old school. In my emails, I to my, to my list, I put out more information as well. So if you are interested in learning more from me, head over to my website and get on my list. Subscribe so that we can be in touch. I'll also be doing more master classes because I miss teaching. So anyway. That's a little scoop here from the Health Fix podcast. I'm Dr. Janine Krauss. I hope you enjoyed this little tidbit on 2 to 4 a.m. wake ups, and hopefully, it's given you some insight. All right, stay tuned for next time. Every Wednesday, I'll be doing this with a little bit of a follow up from my Saturday podcast where I interview folks. All right, have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E, nd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.